we were at a crossroads basically on, with the site. Uh, either we were going to put a survival plan in place, make some big investments, bring shale gas ethane into the site, or we couldn't see a future for petrochemicals. One man is holding this workforce and this country to ransom, and that man is Ineos owner, Jim Ratcliffe. North Sea gases were declining, pension costs had spiralled out of control, salaries were very high. We'd lost hundreds of millions of pounds. At the end of the day, this site either accepted change or we would close down. Round about May, June of 2013, the, this Stevie Dean's issue came to our attention. First of all, he seemed to be spending a lot of time on the Falkirk West constituency Labour Party, and certainly there, was, there were mentions of INEOS people being communicated with and so on. And secondly, clearly it was impacting INEOS reputation. We looked into um, all of the activities of Stevie over that period of time, so it became uh, quite an, uh, an in-depth search and, and revealed significant uh, amount of, 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 of information that showed quite clearly that, uh, that he had been um, spending significant amount of time and misusing INEOS systems. I had suspended Stephen Deans in the morning. Uh, by the middle of the afternoon, I had a phone call from Len McCloskey. Four points that were really clear for me. One, he would put every resource that the trade union had and beyond uh, to bring the site to a standstill if we didn't reverse the decision. The second point was that he could not be responsible for any wildcat action. The third point was that we had every right to investigate and that he was, if we lifted the suspension, he would step away from any further involvement and that we could carry on with the investigation. And the fourth point was, could I make sure that that full content and that conversation was relayed to our uh, owner, Mr Ratcliffe? For the head of Unite to ring us up and threaten to shut us down because we treated his union convener in a way that we'd treat any other employee and that he's not, he's, he's not a sacrosanct individual who's not to be touched and can do whatever he wants. It's, it's just outrageous, <laughs> in my view, in the UK. I put the phone call into Mark Lyon, yeah, you know, one of the site conveners here, to um, just confirm exactly what it was he was telling us in the notification he just sent us. And he repeated to me three times, Declan, this is strike action, this is strike action, this is strike action. The union, I, I think, made a very, very uh, heinous error in deciding to take on the Stevie Deans issue as their cause celebre here, um, because it, it was basically saying, despite the crisis the site's in, despite closure in 2017, your union isn't worrying about those issues that are really important to your future. They're worrying about so-called harassment of the union convener. Well, the officials from both the Unite Union and INEOS, which uh, runs the Grangemouth plant, uh, arrived at the Glasgow headquarters of ACAS shortly before four this afternoon, and uh, they went in for that meeting at four, and we've not heard a dicky bird since. Uh, both uh, parties told me privately outside that they expected the talks either to be short and sharp with no resolution, or, as they seem to be doing, going long on longer into the evening with some kind of a positive outcome. We had these guys on the run. We taking them to a place they've never been before. You know, the assets were coming down and we were telling them these assets are not coming back up until we've got certainty that there's going to be no more action. The second day of talks at the conciliation service ACAS are still going on in Glasgow city centre. We're live now to our political editor, Bernard Ponsonby, for the latest. Uh, both delegations arrived at ACAS for a second day of talks. That's about uh, half past 12 this afternoon. Uh, they've been talking since one o'clock, four hours of talks yesterday, so that's over nine hours of talks in total. And as they get round the table, well, the atmosphere must have been pretty tense because both sides issued a statement today in rather terse tones, blaming one another for a lack of any progress uh, yesterday. We agreed in principle as to what we were going to do and what the agreement was. It was only when we documented it and we were finished documenting that at five, six o'clock in the morning, that we couldn't get agreement on the words around what we thought we'd agreed.
all of a sudden the trade union are sending people to Jim Ratcliffe's properties, they're sending people to our banks and our lenders, they're sending people to our suppliers and customers. Most significantly, locally, they sent a mob to the house of one of our directors. Now, fortunately, his wife and children weren't in, but that's where they were while he was at work. Now, that was a clear step up in strategy from the trade union. I think very unpleasant, um, very unnecessary, and very intimidating for, for the people concerned. The whole thing felt very coordinated. I think we had over 60 different sites all around Europe where we'd had these leaflets distributed. Um, and, you know, it, it just, when we actually dug and found out that there was a leverage unit within Unite, that this was their job, um, that was pretty nasty stuff. And I think, you know, I think the public perception of that, now that it's been exposed, has played very badly for the union. Throughout the day, the management of Grangemouth Oil Refinery and the Union Unite have traded insults following the collapse of talks at the arbitration service ACAS. The union called off a 48-hour strike planned for the weekend, claiming management were intent on running down the plant. Ineas have now announced the complex will remain closed until Tuesday. Here's STV's political editor, Bernard Ponsonby. Today, workers at the plant were briefed by union officials. At five o'clock this morning, they called off a planned 48-hour strike after talks at ACAS broke down. As they decided on their next move, Ineos announced that Grangemouth would remain shut until next Tuesday. We'd made it very clear as we closed the site down that we could not restart that site until we had absolute assurance of no further strike action because stop, start, stop, start was extremely dangerous. So we had failed to secure at ACAS a commitment to no further strike action for the rest of the year. Had we had that, we could have restarted the site. Without that, we didn't have that ability. Hundreds of oil workers have attended a rally as a dispute about the future of their jobs continues. Owners of the Grangemouth refinery have written to employees asking them to agree to changes to pensions and other terms as part of a survival plan for the Scottish site. The key elements of the survival plan were that the company was going to invest three, well, 300 million, so about half of that in a new terminal and about half of that in ongoing losses until the terminal was built. And in return for that, we would have uh, the ending of the current very expensive defined benefit pension scheme and replacing that with a money purchase scheme. We would have a wage freeze for the three year period during which the uh, new terminal is being built. Uh, and we would have a renegotiation of the representation on site that would allow us to move away from the iniquitous full-time convener approach that we still had on site as, as a dint of, by dint of history. The anger at proposals to change their terms and conditions was clear. I've just got a list here of all the things I've tried to take off us, all our good terms and conditions we've got. So try to take our pension, I've tried to take everything off us, try to cut our pay as well. The bullying, the intimidation. The fact that they're trying to tear up our terms and conditions and our pensions, the redundancy terms, everything that people have worked here for for years, it's absolutely unacceptable. You know, we went on a round of intensive site communications. You know, we spoke to, as a board, as an OMP UK board, uh, we spoke to every individual in our business on at least, you know, two, three occasions. We, you know, we communicated internally with them and we also communicated with their, you know, to their home addresses. Did you believe you had a chance of making that case with, with that workforce? I think we had to take the chance. I mean, the management team getting into the control rooms and talking to all the employees about the nature of the changes that are required to give them all the facts, to give them all the information. Again, without a union filter first, that's how things have traditionally happened on the site. So the management team were actually out there telling all the employees the facts. It was the only thing that we could do. The clock is ticking. The company has set a deadline of 6pm tomorrow. The Scottish Government has urged Ineos and the union to negotiate. They're asking the union to, to commit to no strikes. We'll give that commitment. I'm giving you that commitment. You come to this negotiating table, take the guns off the table, take the imposition away, let's sit and negotiate to what is a common aim for us anyway. This strongly worded advert from the union appeared in a number of Sunday newspapers. Grangemouth's owner is remaining firm. Ineos Tonight claimed early responses by its employees to its survival plan have been extremely positive. This is not a case of holding 
uh, holding anyone to ransom. This is the bare facts that a loss-making site needs to change. What we need now is our employees over today and tomorrow by six o'clock to come forward and show their support. Ineas say over 250 staff have backed its survival plan. Unite claim more than 500 forms have been returned unsigned. Half of the workforce have still to respond. Well, I, th I think that particular weekend when people were deciding which way to vote, whether or to vote yes or no for the company survival plan, was a key weekend for us. We, we really needed to use every tool in our armoury to get people to say yes to the company's plan. And the media was a key part of that. Um, clearly, we had communicated directly to them <clears throat> through town hall meetings, through the brochures and, and the documentation we sent them. But we needed pressure from every source. So we needed them to be opening the Sunday papers and reading about the survival plan. We needed their families to be hearing about it on the TV and saying, you know, to, to their spouse or their, their father, what's going on? You know, is, is it as bad as it sounds? We needed all that pressure to apply. Relations between unions and management at the crisis-hit Grangemouth oil refinery have deteriorated further as a deadline passed for the workforce to accept new contracts. Workers had until 6 o'clock tonight to say whether they would agree to less favourable terms and conditions. Unions have predicted that a majority will have said no. Half the workforce return their forms saying, we're in, we want this business to succeed in the future, here are our forms. The union said to their members, please return your forms to the union office. Now, whether they were signed up yes or no or nothing, it doesn't matter. Those forms were returned to the trade union office. And I think mistake number three, because on the Monday of that week, at the end of that process, we had Pat Rafferty, the, the regional officer for Unite, demonstrating outside with his box of 600 and odd forms saying that people clearly rejected the survival plan, so over to you, Mr Ratcliffe, what you're going to do next. I was shocked. I didn't believe. The management, I think, are a very credible group of people. They're very honest. Uh, they're very straightforward. We've all got very good antenna at interpreting whether somebody telling you a story is telling it straight or not straight. And... Um, I was very shocked that they either had not got the message over to the union members on that Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, when they were trying to tell people, we need change to secure the investment for the future of Grangemouth, or the alternative is very grim. So they'd either not got that message over, or the bond between those people and the union was so strong that they were prepared to risk the whole future of Grangemouth and and so we were all quite shocked at the end of Monday quite quite shocked all is not well inside this sprawling powerhouse Ineos says its Grangemouth plant is losing 10 million pounds a month holding people to hostage it's holding the Scottish economy to hostage um, and that's outrageous and as I say there's economic um, vandalism that's taking place right now with this owner so it's not a it's not a five minute decision it takes a lot of thought, but we, don't, we didn't have a lot of time, so that was, that was the, our Tuesday, was dwelling on that very serious issue. And unfortunately, at the end of the day, they, there really was only one answer to come out of that day, and it came out. What caught us off guard was the fact that over 90% of union members said no. Uh, and yes, you'd expect all the kind of top management and all the rest to, to sign up to it, of course. Um, it was that that caught us off guard, because what that actually said was, the entire operator workforce, the guys that are actually on the plant, turning dials on machines and looking after valves and making sure it all operates safely, have all said no. And so if they don't believe in the future, there is no plant. It doesn't matter how many layers of management you've got and how many senior people you've got, you just cannot operate the plant if you haven't got the support of your basic workforce. I've worked here for 25 years. It's probably the worst day in my professional career having to go through that. But equally, I could understand where Ineos Capital were coming from. You know, why, why would you? So the Wednesday we had to come back and tell the workforce that that was the situation, that the chemicals business was going to close. 
In a hammer blow to the Scottish economy, the owners of the petrochemicals plant at Grangemouth have announced it's to close with the loss of 800 jobs. Worst day of my working career by a, by a long way. You know, I, mean, uh, I don't know how I didn't I didn't know how we were going to do it. Uh, you know, we had the slides, but you know, it, it wasn't about slides. It was about the message and you know, to, to be in a room, see the reaction on people's faces, see the emotion, um, see the anger. A lot of anger, but uh, it was a horrible, horrible day for Grinsworth. It looms large on Scotland's industrial landscape, and this was a big moment in the history of the Grangemouth refinery as morning broke on decision day. Management had decided on its next step in a dispute with the workforce. Waves of employees attended back to back meetings in the staff canteen to be told it was closure of half the site. I've left after the first 10 minutes, mate. I couldn't last, keep listening to it. You said that whoever told you the news was smiling. Tell me about that. Cal McLean. One of the boys actually said that they didn't find it funny that he was smiling as he was telling us we were all out of job. What did he say? He said it wasn't about us. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad he got it. One man left the closure meeting and went up to the television cameras and said that you had smiled uh, as you made that closure announcement. Was that true? No, I mean, you know, the Wednesday during the announcer of the closure was probably one of the most difficult times in anybody. Not many people will go through that experience of standing up in front of seven or 800 people and telling them you're closing an asset down and they're all gonna be made redundant and there's not gonna be any redundancy pays and we don't even know whether you'll be in a job at this by Christmas time. So that was a pretty difficult thing to have to do to stand up in front of those people and say that. And after that announcement was made, there was many, many questions flying. There was lots of uh, shouting in, even in the room itself between unionized and non-unionized people and some of the questions coming back to me and the management team were pretty aggressive as well so it was not the environment that uh, anybody would feel like smiling so so no is the answer. Did you at that point believe that the petrochemicals business was finished at Grangeman? Absolutely I, I was in the meeting within the OS Capital on the Tuesday it was absolutely clear in the faces of, of those guys making that decision that they had no pleasure at all in making that decision. They were extremely disappointed, to put it mildly, that that's the decision that was being made. But that was a real decision. That was a real decision being made there and then. No doubt about it whatsoever. Well, the patch of chemical plant here at Grangemouth employs 800 people directly many more indirectly. Tonight the First Minister, Alex Salmond, has said that the Unite Union has made a fresh offer, uh, fresh proposals uh, to the owners in EOS. He's saying that no one should write this plant off yet. I think a significant development this afternoon is new proposals have been made by Unite to the company. Now I hope the company can consider these. I spoke to both Unite and indeed I spoke to Jim Radcliffe uh, this afternoon. I hope these can be favourably considered because they do seem to me, at first sight at least, to address the, the cost issues which the company had brought forward. Within an hour or two hours of, of that meeting finished that uh, we, we got a call from the, the trade union leadership on site saying, you know, we need, we need to talk. And the message instantly was, we'll, we'll do whatever it, whatever's needed. We'll do whatever is needed to get the survival plan back on the table. There was a significant amount of interest and we uh, attempted to engage with uh, every inquiry that came, came through, the, through the door, um, whether it was Newsnight, whether it was uh, Radio 5 Live, whether it was The Telegraph, The FT um, or, 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 or smaller, more, more local outlets. We were, we were very active during that period, making sure that journalists understood the facts, making sure that they understood the background, um, which was important not just for the general public, um, but it was important for our employees who are reading uh, the newspapers and, and for their families who were, were also getting information through media channels. <laughs> Now, Tom Crotty's on the board of INEOS, the company who owned the Grange Mouth plant. Um, have you heard anything about this proposal from Unite? I haven't as yet, um, and uh, we'll wait and see if that comes through tomorrow. I mean, what, I, what I'm hearing 
is that uh, if what they're saying is true, it is diametrically opposed to what they were saying only two days ago, which was they t totally rejected our survival plan. And that's what basically caused most of the Unite representative people on site to vote against it. I mean, I thought Newsnight particularly would be very, very difficult with, with Paxman. I'd not, I'd not done uh, National Newsnight with Paxman before, so I was slightly nervous about it. Um, as it turned out, uh, I think he was pretty good. Um, he, was, he was, for him, I think, pretty gentle. Um, he did, uh, at that point, by the time I got into the Newsnight studio, we were already seeing the unions rolling back big time. McCluskey had been on site during the day. He'd made public statements about how the union were willing to accept all of the company's requirements to give us no strike agreements, etc. The billionaire who controls the fate of the petrochemical complex at Grainsmouth is tonight deciding whether a U-turn by unions will save the plant. Officials from Unite have informed Jim Ratcliffe that they now accept his company's plans. So we had to go back in that 24 hours between the unions effectively stepping down or, or agreeing to the, um, to the uh, survival plan. We had to put a package of things together to demonstrate to the shareholders that we not only were going to be able to deliver the change on the site, but that we had this, we still retained the support of the Scottish Government for our grant. We retained the support of the UK Government for our loan guarantee. And at a later stage, we brought BP into that discussion as well in order for BP to give us support and a release on some of the uh, contracts that were of the gas we were buying from them on the North Sea. When we did get that package and it became apparent that there was the possibility of a very good future for Grangemouth, we couldn't have been happier at that moment because it, it had, um, we'd seen some lows that we'd never seen in our working lives and then we sort of in a sense had a high that we'd not seen in our working lives either. We'd been to both ends of the, uh, both ends of the spectrum, both bookends. Yeah, yeah. Dawn in Grangemouth and the day starting with nothing more than a hope. 48 hours on from news that the petrochemical plant here was to close, workers marched to a mass meeting with optimism. And this is what they heard. We are very happy to announce that following a meeting with the shareholders yesterday that uh, Grangemouth Petrochemicals will remain open. I went over there with the management. The press were massive outside the front of the building. The room was absolutely packed. There was seven, eight hundred people in that room. And we actually arrived over in the room seven, eight minutes before we were due to start. So I sat down and the room went absolutely silent. The room was so packed they couldn't have got anybody else in anyway. And I thought, well, I can't wait until 11 o'clock when we were due to go because it was just deafening silence in the room. So we stood up eight minutes early to start this presentation. And I said, look, I can't go through these slides I've got here. I just need to tell them straight away. So I stood up and said, look, before we go through this presentation, I'd like to tell you all that the division, decision has been reversed and that the chemicals plant will stay open. And the emotion that just erupted in the room was fantastic. I mean, it put just a shiver down my spine, gave me goosebumps, all those types of things that you want to say. There was a cheer went up. Um, and just to see the kind of joy on everybody's face was absolutely fantastic. We set up a press conference, um, which we held uh, and decided to hold quite close to the actual area where uh, Callum would be talking to our employees because we knew that there would be some emotion and we wanted that emotion to literally come through the doors when Callum walked through the doors with that decision. And it was more than that. The, the applause from the room was, 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 was significant, it was massive. Um, the doors were slightly ajar, shall we say, and everybody in the, in the area, all of the press heard that. They started to report on the applause. They were reporting on, on it as it happened. So when Callum walked around the corner to announce that the, the plant would uh, be remaining open and there would be investment, um, he, was, he was already facing some very positive questions from the media and a tremendous atmosphere. Euphoria. Everybody's happy, you know. It's a new chance for the site, so, you know, we've got to go back to work now and get the plant started, so she's all in. Yeah. Santa's back. Good result. Everybody were out there, you know, the media guys were showing me pictures, of the, you know, the famous pictures of Eddie Heaney and others, you know, walking out with their thumbs up. It was 
which is great. It was, it was a fantastic morning, a fantastic day. Absolute delight that we, you know, we, 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 we've done it. We, we had, you know, we changed Grangemouth. We have given Grangemouth the future. So just, just you know, a, a tremendous, tremendous feeling. I see and feel a new atmosphere about, about Grangemouth already. People who are more realistic about how things should be, people who are prepared to read and understand the business messages that we're putting out and the financials. I think people are just more acutely aware now of the business and the business situation, but equally what might be possible with, uh, with shale gas in the future. Yeah, it was a, a roller coaster week, wasn't it? Really? It was nothing anybody, nobody could have ever predicted the, the path that this dispute would have taken. Nobody could have predicted that employees would have said no to change and yes to closure. Um, probably no, would have, no, no one would really have predicted that we would have shut that Grangeman site down. Um, nobody would have predicted that the unions would do a U-turn within a millisecond. I mean, it was a, I mean, you just couldn't have, you couldn't have written, you couldn't have written the story, could you? <laughs> yeah.